Ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Rico back at it again. I apologize for the wait. Daddy duty calls, baby. Let's go. We are here. Tuesday night off season. You guys already know what it is. It's time to get to it. It's the Buffalo Fanatics, the Rico Report. We have some things to talk about. A few things on the horizon, if you will. Uh, Cam Newton getting 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 hands put on him. <laughs> we gonna talk about that a little bit. Terrible look for the culture. Terrible look for guys trying to you know, bring something to the community. We got things to talk about. We got our guy, our own Dion Dawkins. Ah, uh, Dion. We gotta talk about this, man, because I'm, I'm I, I feel some type of way about this. This Dion interview uh, with my guy Vlad TV. Anyway, if you guys already know what time it is with that, we'll get into it. And then we get into one of the media, I guess, position groups on the team. And that's the receiver position. You guys are you guys already know. I don't got to tell you. It was a little lackluster near the end of the season. We had some bright spots. We had some bright moments. But I feel like we weren't as consistent as we wanted to be at the receiver position. Starts with our top dog, Stefan Diggs. It moves over to our number two, Gabriel Davis, or our former number two, Gabriel Davis. We don't know what's going to happen with that. Do they bring him back? Who knows? Do they feel that he's part of the process? Do they feel that he was part of the problem? We're about to find out. We're about to dive in, and then we will make our opinion. We will make our, 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 we will touch on that and find out if we feel that he, is someone that we want to bring back to the squad? Did Khalil Shakir show us enough? Right? Do we uh, do we trust in DeAndre Hardy to come back and give us something? I mean, if you think about it, that's as deep as the receiver position went. If you think about it, like what we what we actually utilized, and then we got to touch on the tight end room. Quinn Morris, do we get do we get Quinn Morris back? Do we like what we saw from Quinn Morris? Dalton Kincaid, do we like what we saw from the Rook? Dawson Knox, is he worth the money being paid? So many questions. We got to talk about it. But first and foremost, I got to thank everybody for tuning in. I know it's the offseason. It's tough to digest a lot of the stuff here. Uh, but we're going to chip away. We're going to chip away here and there and uh, make this uh, at least somewhat of an enjoyable offseason because there's some things that we could really do talk about uh, and touch on. Uh, so first things first, let's, let's get into uh, noise. Noise around the league, and uh, let's let's talk about our guy Cam Newton. All right, Cam Newton. Obviously, he's got a podcast that he's uh, he's prom- he's been promoting, and I, I actually quite enjoy um, the the content that he does put out. Uh, I know that he was uh, he went on like a, a little world tour talking about Brock Purdy and game managers and what is what consists of a game manager quarterback, and it's not that bad of a th- thing. We get that part. I mean, I, I actually truly do agree with a lot of the things that Cam was touching on. But Cam Newton, as do a lot of players around the league, go back to where they're from, go back to their community where they grew up. And where they grew up, they probably didn't have someone come in and say, you know what, I'm going to put on a camp. I'm going to put on a, a 7v7. I'm going to put on somewhere where you can showcase your abilities, showcase your skill set. And who knows? Who knows who's watching? Right. This gives you an ability to to develop getting ready to go to high school, getting ready to go to collegiate ball. If you're walking on somewhere just to prep you to get you going. A lot of times these players never got that growing up. So they have an opportunity to give back to their community and for parents of children that, that aspire to be able to do something great. This is an opportunity. So here comes Cameron Newton going into as I believe seventh year of doing this 7v7 camp and then all hell breaks loose 
Now, let me let me give you a little something because there's uh there's some I guess some audio out there, some video out there of the coaches of this said TSP crew uh, that uh, they they actually touched on this subject. Now, before I even get to that, if you guys remember, I think it was just last year or a couple of years ago, Cam was in the same situation where these young bucks were just talking greasy, just talking out of pocket, just straight disrespecting Cam Newton right to his face. And he's saying, hey, and he, and he fired back, but he was in a respectful way. So even then, when those things were, were being talked about, we were like, that's kind of odd that these young kids are just talking to him, just all disrespectful. Like, it was crazy. So now, fast forward to this year, all hell breaks. It was a big old scrap. And all you see is Cam Newton, 6'5", 240, 250, whatever the size he is, 6'6", right? He's got one by the collar of his shirt. He's got one in a, you know what I mean, backwards headlock. And he's controlling these cats. You know what I'm saying? Just relax. And to my understanding, it was grown men mixed with teenagers. Just a hot mess. Black folk, we need to be better. I'm telling you right now. I mean, you and someone touched on it. If Tom Brady, if uh, Brock Purdy, if Kirk, Kirk Cousins were to hold these camps, you ain't seen anything like that. You're not going to see any any scuffles happening at these things, man. So, like, we as black folk, we got to be better, man. You got an opportunity, and you got a, a, a former NFL player that's still relevant coming to give you guys some some an opportunity, and you messing the game up for other kids that want an opportunity. And shame on the coaches, and shame on the organizers that allow this mess to happen. Just a mess. I don't like it. It's not a good look, and it makes – Maybe Cam Newton might cancel it. They're telling people, they're telling Cam, yo, you should just not do this anymore. They don't deserve it. But you know what? Don't let a couple bad apples ruin it for everybody else, right? You just got to be more selective on who comes and who doesn't. So that crew, y'all got to go. And we replace it with another one for those that are going to respect what's being put out there. I, I just I just hate it. I'm not a fan of it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? As a, as a culture, we got to be better. And not even as a culture. Forget about that. We just got to be better, period. That's just what it is. So uh, that being said, Cam Newton, Trying to do good things, but uh, it didn't turn out so great. Uh, let's move on to the next topic here, and then we'll get into our, our main topic of the night. And that is Dion Dawkins. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have, have touched on the Dion Dawkins. I know my man Z-Bot uh, touched on it last night just a little bit. But Vlad, if you guys don't know who Vlad TV is, Vlad interviews a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people from the hip-hop culture to pop culture. And uh, if you're ready to sit down... He pretty much gets you to just chat. No different than what Club Shay Shay is, really. You know what I'm saying? But Club Shay Shay is a little on more on the positive side. Vlad TV just gets you, he just gets you singing like a canary on certain things. So here comes Deion Dawkins talking about his hatred for the New York Jets. I get it. You don't like the squad. You don't like certain players on that team, more specifically Clements. And you guys had a little scuffle the year before, or excuse me, this year. And uh, we had the last laugh because obviously where we went and where they went, and it was just a totally different year. Now, how do you guys feel about players talking about other players the way Deion Dawkins did for this Jets player? Because I was, I didn't feel, I'll tell you right now, I didn't, initially, I did not feel great about it. I was like, in my in my personal opinion, I was like, why? Why even why even broach that subject? Why even bring it up? Why even let Vlad TV get you to even utter those words? And now you've got this all over the internet. Now you got, I mean, not that they're gonna use this bulletin board material, but you know what I'm saying? Dion Doc is talking ish, pop on that board. So when we play these boys and we have our quarterback and we bolster this defense up. Yo, we are going to give it to Deion Dawkins. We're going to give it to this offense. Not that they need any more of a motivation because they play us tough regardless. So now you got a little extra juice on the end of it because Deion is 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 beaking up his is his guns. Now, the other side of me is with Deion because I can't stand the Jets. Can't stand them now. As a fan, we can say that shit. But as a player, yo, just let your let your play speak for itself. We ain't got to do all that talking. Because now it's just going to get, it's just going to be chippy. It's going to be, I mean, you kind of like that. 
you kind of like a rivalry. You kind of like, you know what I mean, when there's bad blood between two teams. So I'm, I'm like split down the middle, but I lean a little bit more towards, yo, we ain't got to talk. You know what I'm saying? Let my talking, when, my, when, my, when I put my hands on you and I pancake your ass into the ground, that's my type, that's my type of talking. I ain't got to talk to you about all this other stuff. So here comes Deion Dawkins talking all this junk, and uh, now it's circulating. It's circulating. And now Jets fans are, and Jets players are kind of beaking back. Sauce Gardner being one of them was like the same guy that's talking about, oh, these guys don't love football. They don't, you know what I'm saying? They don't, uh, what was the other thing he said? They're just there for Instagram. And they're like, yo, and some guy's like, is this you? And you got Deion Dawkins posing shirtless. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's craziness. But if you know Dion the way I believe I do, because I've I've spoken to this guy personally and I love this dude. So he is as real as they come. So if he meant that, he meant that. That's how he feels. And <laughs> when it comes time to it, guess what? He's going to have to talk with his hands yet again when these Bills and Jets meet up because they meet twice a year. And you know what? If things work out the way they're supposed to work out, maybe the Jets take a leap and they make the playoffs and we play them a third time. You just never know. I mean, look at the Miami Dolphins. This is we just, sometimes it happens, right? So that being said, <laughs> Deion Dawkins obviously I uh, bumping them gums. I'm with him because I don't like the Jets and I can't stand them. And if anytime I can get a chance and watch my team wax the Jets, I'm for it. And if there's a little chap, you know what I mean, a little chatter at the end of it, cool. Now to go broadcast that chatter. And now, you know what I'm saying? Now it's a, it's a little different. Chatting on the field. You know what I'm saying? Within the lines, locker room, all that bullshit, cool. But you ain't gotta, you ain't gotta do all that talking, bro. Just do all your talking with your hands, baby. You know what I'm saying? Put your paws on that brother, and that's it. And the rest of them cats. Anyway, neither here nor there. But I, I just wanted to touch on that because I, I thought it was a, an interesting uh subject uh to touch on. Now, main event for tonight, folks. And it's gonna come down to the receiver room. And we are going back to the process or problem. If you guys are enjoying this type of content that uh, we are bringing you from Buffalo Fanatics, do show some love. Smash that like as you guys are here. I know it's the off season, but we got to get through these things. We have to get through these things to, to, to you know, we make this somewhat of an enjoyable off season because free agency is around the corner, people. Free agency is around the corner. We've got the draft <laughs> just a little further around the corner. And then by the time that you you blink, Yo, we're in the we're, we're in mini camp. It's crazy. It goes by quick. It really does go by quick. So, here is the deal: the receiver room. A lot of folks might say, you know, what I mean, were we were we good at the at the receiver position? I mean, when you look at when you look at this Bills roster on paper, Stephon Diggs. You look at Dawson Knox. You look at the rookie Dalton Kincaid. I mean, there's so many, there's so many uh, avenues you can look at this team and say, "Yo, this team is a talented team." Josh Allen, the quarterback. So there's so many ways you can look at this team and say, "Yo, this team is gonna is forever going to be a, a formidable team." Like you're you're always gonna have to really you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to show respect to this team no matter what. Show up every day to play these this team because. They're dominant. We've seen it time and time again. And you look at this receiving room, Diggs, Davis, Shakir. We had a little bit of Deontay Hardy, uh, a little bit of Trent Sherfield. Um, but when you look at the list after Stefan Diggs and maybe Gabe Davis, after that, it's underwhelming. You're like, eh, that's okay. Now, not every team has a, a lineup where you're like, oh, that's a good name. Oh, that's the name. That's a, there's not, there's not very many, right? If you look at, uh, we'll go to the Bengals for sure, for, for sure. Where we got Jamar Chase, T Higgins, Tyler Boyd. That's a good trio. This is a solid trio, right? Because you know, T Higgins can get to it. You know, Jamar Chase can get to it. And Tyler Boyd has had a solid career. When you look at the bills, Stefan Diggs gets to it. He gets busy. That's my guy. Gabe Davis, inconsistent. At least this year, he's definitely been inconsistent. And then Kalusha Kier is only coming up in the game, right? He's just getting he's just getting his feet wet. So his third year, I anticipate a big year for, for Kalusha Kier. But then after that, womp, 
swamp. You, you could have put anybody. It just didn't. It just it did. It didn't move the needle for us. So this is where I believe we need to bolster. We need to help our guy Josh out. So it starts with our guy Stephon Diggs. He played all seventeen games this year. Third year in a row of having more than a hundred receptions. Off of 160 targets, 1,100 yards receiving, just just over 11 yards a pop, eight touchdowns, eight receiving touchdowns, and he was averaging just shy of 70 yards a game. He lost two fumbles, excuse me, he fumbled twice and had 400 yards of yak off of 58 first down receptions. Stephon Diggs. I love Stephon Diggs. I think he brings a mentality to this team. I think he brings a mentality to Buffalo. I think he brings a star-studded, um, I guess, a prowess wherever he goes. You build around something like that. Now, I know there's been conversation about uh, does he really want to be here? Is he committed to the Bills? Is he too focused on the outside world? Is he too focused on the fashion? Is he too focused on, I mean, walking around and and, and just using his social media to do whatever? I mean, there's so many there's so many people talking about Stefan Diggs in and sometimes out of pocket, really. And time and time again, he's come back and said. I'm trying to be here. I'm looking forward to retiring as a bill. I mean, the guy just signed an extension just last year to, to stay with us, right? To move money around. So he's here for the long haul. And if you look at his contract, that brother's contract, it doesn't really give you much room to say bye-bye because that, that cap hit is a monster. one. So like he is there now. There's been a couple of interviews where it sounds like, man, does he want to be here? But when you really dig deep to it, I mean, you don't really have to dig too deep. But when you really look at the words for what he's really saying is like nothing is certain in this league. And he, he ain't lying. Nothing is certain because when you think you're going to be part of a team and all of a sudden they trade you, you think they tag you because they're trying to work a long term deal. They tag you just to trade you. Right. This is the NFL where they will move you if they need, if they don't feel that you are conducive enough to this team, if they feel that you aren't enough uh, to move the needle for this team and the money that they're paying you is too steep, they will ask you restructure or they'll say, we're trading you or we're cutting you. That's it. They don't, they don't, there's no time to talk. They just do what they do. So when it comes to a guy like Stefan Diggs, when he's been answering questions and telling you, I'm trying to be here, and those that are saying, well, here are the trade packages to try to, it's it's slim that it's going to happen. So, Stefan Diggs, in my opinion, is here to stay. Is he a problem? Heck no. Is he a problem for defenses? Absolutely. Is he part of this process that makes this engine go? 1,000% because ever since he's moved to the Bills and has been traded to the Bills and we acquired him in trade, Josh Allen has only been the best version of himself. The same could be said about Stefan Diggs. He's been the best version of himself. Statistically, he's had his best, I mean, his best moments as a Bill. It makes sense. When you have a quarterback like Josh Allen, that pairing just works. Why folks are trying to separate, I will never understand. But, it is a conversation nonetheless. People are having that conversation. But he is the real deal. He may not have that 4-3 speed. I mean, hell, TJ Graham had 4-3 speed. How long did he last in the league? So it's not always about the speed. It really isn't. It's about can you separate? How good are you at running routes? How good is your chemistry 
with your quarterback? How good are you at reading a defense and and analyzing and and making quick decisions as to should I sit? Should I keep going? Right? Should I stop here? Okay, he's reading me. It's a read option. Okay, so what am I doing here? So those things matter. And that's what Stefan Diggs brings to the Bills. That's what allows others to do what they do because he is that good. So for me to sit here, and I'm not saying people are poo-pooing on Stefan Diggs because I, I really highly doubt it is, but the notion of him not being part of the squad is insane to me because now, I mean, eventually it's going to happen where, I mean, obviously father, father time catches up with us all. And that's when business decisions need to be made. But he's 30. He's not 38. You know what I'm saying? He ain't 37. He's not on his last legs. I mean, he. some might say, you know what I mean? This is where he settles in at, okay, I may be losing a touch of my speed, but I still have my route running ability. And, here, and, and here's the one thing that I have to say. These 1,100 yards that you see here from Stephon Diggs, would have been way more had he hit on some deep routes from Steph from from Josh Allen. There were at least four that I can count on the top of my head. Four moments, maybe five moments this year alone, where Stephon Diggs did his job as a receiver and got open and wide open. I'm talking about this could go for 50, 50 plus, fifty plus. Josh Allen overthrows him. So when you look at these 1,100 yards, you're like, okay, yeah, he did that. But my goodness, this, this was easily could have been a 1,500-yard season for Stephon Diggs had they had moments that they hit. But you're not going to hit every big play. It's just what it is. You're not going to. But I will say this. For any of that chatter of Stephon Diggs not being part of, this, part of this team, I'm not here for it. I'm not here for it. My man Gabe says, yo, have you watched the last seven games? Of course I have. But this plays into what I'm saying, what I just said now. There are moments where Josh did his job, gets off the, gets off the cut, rips in, puts his hand up wide open. Josh goes somewhere else. Or Josh misses him deep, right? So those last seven games, in those last seven games, I can, I can tell you probably three, three moments where – that breaks open a game completely. And I'm looking at, I'm, I'm going to go to see, give me, give me a moment here while I look at Stefan Diggs' last moments. I mean, not last moments per se, but what, what he was able to do the last seven. Because, I mean, if we're going to talk about the last seven, let's talk about last seven. Let me see here. All right. So we'll start with Philly. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll, we'll, call, we'll, we'll start with the Jets. So the Jets, four for eight. All right, we all we all know the Jets are a tough team. We won that game thirty-two to six. That's Joe Brady. I think that's when Joe Brady took over. Team was rolling. We go to Philly. He goes six receptions for seventy-four yards and a touchdown. We go to Kansas City. We win in Kansas City. Four receptions for twenty-four yards. Four receptions for forty-eight yards against Dallas. We ran the ball all over Dallas. We didn't even have to throw the football. You remember that game? I don't got to really tell you about that. So we could watch that game or we can whatever but i think josh had seven completions all game and seven of those completions <laughs> excuse me four of those completions went to josh uh to stefan Diggs. right we didn't really need to do anything against the chargers we're five for 29 i really hoped that we would have had a bigger game that game i think that was one of the one of the one of the misses that josh had a big miss to stefan Diggs while he was wide open missed him not a big deal it happens you're not always going to be hitting a thousand, right? You go up against New England, New England, four for 26, and then Miami, uh, seven receptions for 87 yards. All right. So that's your last regular season game. So in those last seven, I can tell you there was probably three moments where your 48 yard game could have been easily an 87 yard game with a touchdown if we miss. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of of things that go into that. But to me, you Stefan Diggs is still that dude. If I don't, I'm not gonna sit here and hear someone say, Oh, but look at the last seven games. Look at look at the totality of what he brings to this team and what he opens up for everybody else. And when you have a 
I don't want to say not a competent, but if you have a consistent number two receiver that does what he's supposed to do, it opens up the game for everybody. It really does. So to me, that's that's my stance on it. I know uh, Gabriel is not feeling it. I think Gabriel is probably one of the people that is like, yo, get rid of this guy. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Gabriel. But like when you're saying like you're talking bullshit when Dorsey got fired and Diggs wasn't the focus, we started to win uh, without Diggs or Davis. You're wrong. So he feels that we can win without Diggs and, and, and we're good. That's what Gabe feels. Now, some folks might feel, might feel the same. Here's the one thing that you need to you do need to know, and if I'm, I'm I think I'm reading it right. Here's one thing you need to know: Diggs doesn't miss many games. He's he's as consistent as they come. So you're not, you, there's not many games where you'll see no digs, and we have major success. I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to it, but not yet, because <laughs> he's still that dude. He's still that dude. So we'll see. Uh, Lord says, honestly, I wondered if Josh squandered the offseason last year because uh, he, to me, came in cold. Yes, we thought Dorsey held him back, but I can't say that was 100% the reason. Um, listen, first year, these boys were cooking. They were really doing well, Dorsey and, and uh, Josh Allen and the whole offense. We were doing well, but I mean, there was, there was residual, you know what I'm saying, I guess, off of Dable because Dable ran that office for, for, for quite some time. So when Dorsey took over, you kind of, you factored in a lot of what, Do what Dable was doing. And then finally Ken Dorsey was able to run his own offense with the 12 personnel. And we had the people. And at first we were doing very well. The beginning of the season we were cooking, we were doing extremely well until we get, we got into a lull and that happens. Certain teams go into lulls where certain things get figured out. We can't, we can't really get things going. And, uh, and then you, you catch fire again. And that's exactly what happened. We started off hot, got a little cold, and then, you know what I'm saying, people's jobs were on the line. And it eventually cost Ken Dorsey his job because he wasn't, he wasn't getting the offense where it needed to be. We had too, too good of an offense to allow that to happen. And the crazy part is, statistically, we were, we were pretty good. It's just that we weren't getting the results. We weren't getting the wins. And the fact, and that was what, what factored in. Now, the big difference here, and Clay Miles said it, is run game. Once Joe Brady took over, we had more of a balance. Once Joe Brady took over, there was not a, a need to throw the football 35 to 40 times a game. We could rely on the run. We can give the, the rock 18 to 20 times to James Cook and share it amongst the guys. So that was, that was the, in my opinion, the bigger difference between a Dorsey run offense and a Joe Brady run offense. There was a little more trust in the running back to get the running back some touches to open the game up. So I saw that's this is why this is going to be a big time factor this off season and going into next year to see how Dorsey now, excuse me, not Dorsey, uh, Joe Brady now takes over as the guy. Like this is going to be his offense. He sprinkled in. I mean, if you listen to um, Coach McDermott's uh, presser. He spoke a little bit on Joe Brady. He's going to be sprinkling in. I mean, he was sprinkling in his own offense a little bit during the season last year. Now you're going to, he's going to be fully immersed into his own offense. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out in the offseason. So when it comes to Stefan Diggs, folks, process all day. Gabriel in the chat may not feel that way. Gabriel feels that maybe Diggs is not that dude. He's fallen off the cliff. We should be moving on from him. I'm, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but just, I mean, based off his energy, it don't seem like he's really all that, I mean, interested in having Diggs on the squad. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm tripping. We shall see. Now let's move on. He says, talk to me, talk to me about Diggs stats in the playoffs. I've talked to this. I've talked about this a lot. This is, this is where I need more from Diggs because these last few years in the playoffs, he hasn't been the factor that we needed him to be. I think he had one good playoff season is that's when we went to the AFC championship game, right? But after that, it's been, it's been lackluster. And that's one thing I will give to Gabe. Playoff digs with the Bills after the first time he was with us hasn't been that great. But this is where we need everybody to step their game up. This is where we need everybody because everybody's game, you're getting everyone's best. So 
I'm not I, I'm in no way, shape, or form I'm saying he's he's he doesn't show up in the playoffs. I think we just haven't done well. I mean, look, go back to the Bengals game. That was that was awful. That was awful as they come, right? There was just some moments where we just needed more from Diggs. We needed more from everybody else. But in the playoffs, I gotta give it to him. He didn't show up the way we needed him to show up. And I think he knows that. I think it's very clear. And this year is going to be very interesting to see if these guys can connect not only in the regular season, but in the playoffs where it freaking matters at the end of the day. But anyway, that's just the way I look at it in that, in that regard. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. Let, let this new offensive coordinator get things going, see if they can keep this up going into the playoffs, and then we go from there. That's what it's going to come down to. Next up, Gabriel Davis. All right. I mean, to me, Gabriel Davis is as good as gone. He's as good as gone. I mean, I, there's really not much to really talk about now. Has his moment in Buffalo been great? I think he's, uh, as a fourth-round draft pick, I think he did solid. I think he did enough, truly enough, to get himself a job elsewhere. And I'm sure he will. He, would, he definitely will. And um, question, the question remains, if we do go, and, and it's not an if, it's not a matter of if, it's when. When we go and get ourselves our receiver, what kind of what kind of uh, what type of receiver are we going to get? And I think obviously, I think we're going to try to mimic what Gabriel Davis was able to do for us uh, in the past four years that he's been with us, and that's be the deep threat. Believe it or not, he has been our deep threat. He's always been the guy to get downfield, and uh, we're going to be missing that in Gabe Davis. But there's so much inconsistency with his play that you're you're almost like i'm good if he leaves and i'll be real if we were to bring him back i i'm not gonna lie to you i'd be kind of disappointed i'd be kind of disappointed because i think that we need to to move on from that type of receiver where to me as much as you want to call him a deep threat which he which he happens to be what we have pinned to be for us i feel the more he's more of like a possession receiver he's not like a, he's not super fast but it's weird because he gets downfield. I, I just don't get it. It's like deceptive speed. I just I don't get it. Anyway, but what I want to say is this. I liked Gabe Davis as, as a receiver of the Bills. I was a fan of him. I think he had, like, I mean, other than that monster, monster game against the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs and maybe against the game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, those are the two games that stood out to me for Gabe Davis in terms of uh, what he's given us um, as a receiver for the Buffalo Bills. I mean, everybody, if you say Gabe Davis, you think Kansas City. If I remove Kansas City, if I remove Kansas City from the equation and I say, what stands out to you or what game stood out to you that Gabe Davis was that dude? Is there any other game than the Kansas City playoff game that you're like, that's the game? And this is a genuine question. This is not even like a, I'm hating on, it has nothing to do with it. I'm just curious as to if you guys remember a game where you're like, yep, remember that game that Gabe Davis had? And you can't name the Kansas City Chiefs game. There's only one that I can think of. And that was the Pittsburgh Steelers game where he had like a, he ripped off a 98 yard reception and then had another game, had, excuse me, uh, I think he had another uh, reception uh, over Minka Fitzpatrick. And he just ripped the ball away from his Mika Fitzpatrick and boom, Bob's your uncle. But that's 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 the one game. Now, if you guys have a game, talk to me. You know what? Bartek said it, the Colts game. That Colts game, you know what? I think uh I he had a solid game that you're not gonna I'm, I, that's the truth. He absolutely had a monster game against that the Colts game. I think it was the playoff Colts game. He did have a good game. That sideline catch on the sideline, I do remember that. That was a that was a massive game. You're right, Bartek. I see that. That Colts game was a big one, and that's good. See, and the Colts game in 2020. All right, so three and a half years ago, what was that? His rookie year, second year. So that that's what I'm trying to say. So he didn't give us, he hasn't given us enough to say, okay, yeah, we 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 need to bring that brother back. So I'm good with him going elsewhere. He'll probably get what he deserves, where he needs to go. But for me, when it comes to Gabe Davis, I think he was serviceable, a very good receiver for the Bills. And I think we got what we needed out of him. 
and it's time for him to go. And there's no there's no shame in that. Sometimes it's just your time. You did great, and it's time for you to dip. And it sucks because he was such a good, good person on this team. I think the team loved him. He was one of the leaders on the team. He was a captain on the squad. So, like, there was some leadership that came with Gabe Davis. There was some, there was some camaraderie that came with him. There was some, some. I mean, you're going to make a brotherhood. You're going to. This is the thing that sucks about the NFL. I mean, you guys have all played sports. When you know I mean, when you're moving up to the next level to move on to play elsewhere, or uh, you're going to go play in university and you're leaving your Pop Warner team. I don't know how it works in the states, but here there's levels uh, of football, and then you go to the next level, and you're so it's just just the way it works, right? So you your your team constantly changes. Guys get cut. You thought they were going to make the team, but they didn't make the team. And you're like, oh damn, I didn't see that coming. So it happens. So the they're going to miss Gabe Davis. They're going to miss Gabe Davis in that locker room. You saw how close he was. And I hear how the players talk about him. Like, I heard Dalton Kincaid, excuse me, Dawson Knox, how Dawson Knox talks about Gabe, Gabe Davis. You hear about how Josh Allen talks to him, uh, talks about him. Stefan Diggs, how Stefan Diggs talks about him. He's like, Stefan Diggs himself was like, Gabe Davis is him. He is that guy. So he's going to be missed by this locker room. There's no question about it. But as for production, it's not enough. It's not enough. I mean, you we can't. I mean, I, I'll say this once, one last time. You can't have a number two receiver go five games in this season with a donut with zero receptions. I think it's time, like my man Nirvana says, man. It's time for a change. Sometimes it's just time for a change. And I think this is uh this is the way to go. Laura, my girl Laura says Gabe is hot and cold. It's true. But apparently he was very valuable blocking when not being targeted. Bills love him. And it's true. He was valuable in the run game, 1,000%. And uh, and there was a lot of moments where he'd do the dirty work and the grunt work. And that can't go unnoticed because that's what makes uh, a receiver a total receiver. Not only can you run down the field and, and run your routes and you affect the run game, that's the type of player you want, like a Heinz Ward type of a receiver. Where if you watch, if you don't watch out, you're gonna get blindsided and he will put you on your ass. But he's able to make plays downfield. I ain't saying Gabe Davis is Heinz Ward, but Heinz Ward was that type of player that not only could he catch the ball downfield and do what he does, but he will block the heck out of you. And he gives you that type of that type of vibe that he could do both. So he will be an asset somewhere. It's just that his time is up in Buffalo. So Gabe Davis, process or problem. It's a problem. <laughs> it, it's just what it is. It's, he's not part of the process. He won't be part of the process, and he's got to go. Now, if they come back and they make him part of the process, and they bring him onto that squad, and they bring him back and give him a ten a ten million dollar a year contract, I can't see it happening. But if it does, I'd be highly disappointed. Highly disappointed in our guy Brandon Bean. That's just the way I look at it. That's just me. Uh, Monster games of Stefan in Buffalo. Um, I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, I don't know which ones you want me to, to give you. Um, are we talking this year, last year? I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, listen, the guys had over a hundred receptions, 1200 yards. Like what you, <laughs> you pick a game and you know what I mean? Go ahead and, and, and get that going. You know what I mean? But, uh, he stays part of the squad. He is actually staying. Gabe Davis on the other hand is on his way out. If we were talking about Gabe Davis being a, a guy that's that is that dude and stay around, then shit. We're not even talking about this. We're saying, yo, this game, that game, this game. But Gabe, Gabe is on his way out. There's no, there's no ways about it. So uh to me, Gabe Davis process or problem. It's probably the problem. I think he's gonna be finding himself in another destination. Next up, our receiver three, Khalil Shakir. Khalil Shakir. Obviously, when uh, when he was brought on to the Bills, a lot I from what I understand, there were some teams that were coveting him in the draft. And the, when the Bills grabbed him, he made him going to the Bills made some some organizations upset. And, oh, we had him, but he got off the hook. And right now, we were able to see some really good things from Khalil Shakir. Khalil Shakir this year played what six seventeen games. Played all seventeen games. 39 receptions from 45 targets, which is amazing. 600 yards receiving, 15.7 yards a pop, 
He had two touchdowns this year. His uh, longest reception was an 81-yarder. He had 10 big plays this year and 282 yards of yak off of 26 first downs. That is just hitting the tip of the iceberg. I think this is where he goes off next year. I think that there's a little more, there's a lot more trust with Josh Allen and with uh, with Khalil Shakir. I think he's getting a lot more comfortable in this offense. I think he's getting a lot more chemistry going with Josh Allen. And I think this year, this coming off season, they're going to put the work in. And Josh Allen said it himself. I haven't met a guy that works this hard. This guy works tremendously hard. He's one of the hardest working guys in the building. And the way this season ended, a, the way Khalil Shakir was ascending, B, and him going into third year is when they all they always put it together. This is this is the formula for success for this offense. You are, you're, you're now going to be able to throw the ball on the outside, throw the ball on the inside, and you can pair him with Don Kate. So we absolutely found our slot receiver. Does he give us the same skill set that we once had with Cole Beasley? Not quite. They're different receiver. But the big difference as to why we moved on from Cole Beasley, I mean, there's a, I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons why we moved on, but the main reason was we needed someone that can catch the ball and move forward. That's why when we moved on from, we brought in McKenzie. McKenzie was a little quicker, a little, I mean, much faster than with Cole Beasley. But it didn't quite pan out the way we wanted it to. It was it was okay. That experiment was okay. We thought that it was gonna bolster, but it didn't. It just ended up being the same to the point where we brought him, we brought Cole Beasley back, right? To give you that idea. So Kilo Shakir being introduced to this team, not only does he give you the ability to catch the ball in the slot, but he's looking for more constantly. I mean, the the best ex- example is the last the last game. I think what was it against uh uh, was it was it against uh, Pittsburgh that he did it? Where he caught the ball in the slot, guy pulls his shoulder, ducks under the shoulder, and goes in for the touchdown. I can't remember who, who what team it was against, but nonetheless, it was huge. I think it was the Pittsburgh Steelers. That was massive. Most guys, if that were Cole Beasley, would catch the ball, maybe make a move, and dive and go down, and then get the ball quickly and get going. But here's Khalil Shakir not satisfied with just getting a reception. It's taking it and getting more out of it. And that is something that we, we've been wanting in that slot position for some time. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Khalil Shakir and this offense is going to bring uh, to the table. And uh, I think that uh, this is going to be massive for this team. And not only that, dude, at six feet of buck 90, man, you could use this guy in the backfield, you can use him for jet sweeps. Like he is that you could use him like a version of Debo Samuels. So this is why I'm excited, not just for him being in the running in passing and receiving the football, but you could use him to kind of move things around and really get these teams going. Like, so this guy is, he's going to be a, a bonafide star in Buffalo, man. I really feel that. I think he's going to be something special. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what uh, what he's going to bring to the table. And by the way, that catch was against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I just had to make sure that it was correct. So Khalil Shakir, process, stamp it. You know what it is. It's, he's a process. He's going to be part of the squad. Now, listen, I can, I can lump all these guys in together in one shot. Deontay Hart. We signed this brother to a two-year deal. We paid him a lot of money. And for the production he gave us, just not worth it. Played all six, he played 16 games, 15 receptions for 150 yards, one touchdown, and uh, he had a monster punt return touchdown. That really was that was that was awesome. It was huge. We needed it. A big boost. But other than that, lackluster. Didn't really bring much. Now one could say, did we use him to his full capacity? Did we actually give him a shot to really succeed? And that that could be the debate. Do we do we know how to use a guy like Deontay Hardy? Did we know how to use him? Did we put him in position? Did he did he put enough work to to gain the trust? And 
there's some ball, there's some some routes that this brother ran were kind of lazy. And you go this guy's way and you're like, bro, did you not know the ball was coming to you? Like, I, it's it's just one of those situations where there were some moments where I'm like, uh, I don't know about this guy. And for for those that are like, well, maybe we didn't really use him enough. If they didn't, it's because they saw everything they needed to see in practice. They saw everything they needed to in these games and it just didn't work out. And we have an ability right now to move on from his services and save us $5 million. I can't see us not saving that money. So to me, Deontay Hardy, I don't know, man. The skill set is there. We know that he's it's possible from the stretch to feel, but we just there was there was nothing there. Some might say, don't give up on him, right? Clay Miles is like, don't give up on him. Well, Clay, are you prepared to give him five million dollars to give you 15 receptions for 150 yards? Is that enough? I think you and I, if they gave us an opportunity, <laughs> we could probably muster up about half that. If that, if they give us I mean, we, we'd be sore, but we could probably muster half that. For five million? I don't know, man. I think I can get more production for five million dollars elsewhere. I can take that five million and add it and try to get someone that will affect this offense. So Deontay Hardy, uh, I don't know. I don't know how the chat feels about Deontay Hardy. He has terrific body control and could very, uh, very well get a, um, get a K receiving, uh, a receiver, a thousand yard receiving. Well, it is possible. Anything is possible. But the money that he's being paid for production that we got, we've got to weigh the pros and cons in this. And this is where money will play a factor. If we feel that we can go into the draft and get two receivers and pay not even close to where we're playing Deontay Hardy. Wouldn't you take that, especially how deep this receiver class is? We might have to do the same thing we did when we drafted Isaiah Hodgins and Gabe Davis in the same draft. And we drafted those brothers fourth and seventh in the seventh round. I think it was, it was the, Isaiah Hodgins was a seventh round pick or a sixth round pick. I can't recall. But we drafted those guys in the late rounds. And look what's happening. Isaiah Hodgins got himself a little contract, small contract, albeit. And Gabe Davis is about to score him a decent contract. It's not a good year to go into free agency, though, because the receiver room, the draft, the draft, excuse me, the receiving draft um, class is a deep one. So hopefully teams want a veteran guy that's been in the game, that's got something that they know they'll get something out of and they'll pay him and he'll be on another squad. But not a great year to go into free agency, knowing how deep the receiver class is. That being said. Deontay Hardy. We'll see. 10K Drippy, what's up, man? He goes, Crowder signing. Hardy Crowder was balling before he got hurt. I like the Crowder sign. Jameson Crowder, I was really excited for that because that was the move they made when they moved on from Cole Beasley to give me the yak. Get me a guy that can give me the ball and get going. But it didn't pan out because the brother got hurt. So we never really got to see Jameson Crowder do what he needed to do. Uh, that being said, though, we still got to make a decision on Deontay Hardy. And as of right now, Based on what we have at the receiver room, I'm not seeing it. I think they move on from, from Hardy. I think it was a one-year one year, one year uh, experiment. And uh, if they decide to bring him back, maybe on a, on, on a move some money around or, or do something. But if you can save four, almost five, $5 million, I think I'm going to take that and then take my chances in a deep receiver class. So I'm out on Deontay Hardy. He is not part of the process, part of the problem, and we'll soon see because it's coming up shortly where they got to make decisions. So we'll soon see what Brandon Bean decides to do uh, when it comes to the receiver room and more specifically with Deontay Hardy. All right, next up, Trent Shurfield. Ah, Trent Shurfield. Trent Shurfield. Trent Shurfield, we brought this brother in to pretty much be depth, obviously. We poached him. From the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins really liked him. They were actually sad to see him go. Uh, could I see a reunion with the Miami Dolphins and Trent Shurfield again? I could. I could see him going back. Um, however, this is one of those situations where Trent Shurfield, it just didn't, it didn't pan out, man. It didn't pan out. And and when all opportunities were given to Trent Shurfield, it still wasn't, it wasn't good enough. He played all 17 games. 11 receptions all year, 86 yards, 
and a touchdown, a very acrobatic touchdown, a touchdown that we needed that kind of got the ball rolling for us where the ball was tipped and he tiptoed, got on the inside, fell right into his arms and fell out of bounds. Awesome, awesome catch and touchdown. But that was the moment for Trent Shurfield that year. That was it. That was the moment. And one can say, well, he wasn't really given opportunity. I mean, 11 receptions off of 22 targets for receiver five, receiver six, um, or option six, if you will. Just not good enough, man. Just not good enough. And uh, I, we didn't pay him big time money, but I can't see the Bills bringing him back. And if they do bring him back, it's going to be such on a low deal um, that is just, it's, it's bro, <laughs> Trent Sherfield was just underwhelming. He was underwhelming, man. He was. I, I expected a little bit more from him, but I didn't. I, we didn't get what we needed out of Trent Sherfield. But well, Rico, what did you expect from a guy that wasn't meant to be on the field as often? And we were going to have Dalton Kate, and we were going to have, obviously, um, Dawson Knox. So there's going to be limited opportunity for Trent Sherfield. And everything that one might say about something like that is correct. There's not much opportunity you're going to get. The one thing that I know he does do well is he affects the run game very well. So if they were going to keep Trent Sherfield, that would be for the reason. A, on a cheap deal. And B, get him in on run, on run, um, run schemes and, and when we're, we're run opportunities. That's where we see him. Goal line, close to the green, green zone, red zone. We see a lot more of that. But obviously, you put him on the field, you're removing someone that can be more skillful and make a difference. So to me, I don't know if if it becomes worth it. Um, like I said, no different from Deontay Hardy. If we can hit the draft and double double dip in the receiver room, I'm all for it. I'm all for it because we got 10 picks. And I believe Brand, Brandon Bean is probably going to package a couple picks together, but we, we're going to have, I mean, at least at least eight picks to make something happen. So um if you move some some picks around, if you're trying to move up somewhere in the draft. But that's the way I see it with Trent Sherfield. So do I see Trent Sherfield returning? I don't. Uh, is he is he part of the process moving forward? Probably not. I see that as a problem. I see us definitely hitting the draft, maybe get, make it a splash in free agency to see if we can bolster this offense. So to me, I'm out on Trent Sherfield, and I'm out on Dalton Kincaid. Um, excuse me, not Dalton Kincaid. Excuse me, uh, Deontay Hardy. Uh, those are the two, uh, the two receivers that I just I can't see us uh, really bringing back on the squad. Now, the receiver room stays. I mean, we still got some 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 guys to talk about. Justin Shorter. We didn't really get to see much of Justin Shorter. Justin Shorter came in. I mean, had a, had a short off season and then was put on the IR because of a low leg injury. I think it was a hammy, and that was it. They shut him down. They shut him down for the year. We never got a we never got a sniff of Justin Shorter. So he is he is a question mark. Obviously, he's going to his second year. So we're going to see a lot more of what Justin Shorter can do. Cause why not? Six four, six five-ish. I mean, can run. He's like 225, give or take. So uh actually let me just get you the true to his true uh what six four two twenty. 220. That's right. Six four two twenty. So and he's a specimen. The guy is just jacked as shit. So there's going to be ample opportunity for him to make some noise this offseason and uh, and really make some noise. So there's not much we can say about Justin Shorter because we didn't really get a chance to see him. All we have is some production from when he was at Florida, and now he's coming on to his second year. Hopefully he was able to learn something while he was rehabbing, while he was on the sideline. So him coming on the squad this year, he has no choice but to be part of the process. We're moving forward. He's part of the the youth movement that we're that we're that we're going towards. So Justin Shorter obviously is going to be uh, one that uh, we're going to keep a close eye on this off season and in mini camps. Tyrell Shavers and KJ Hamler. Now this is why I'm moving on from Deontay Hardy because you brought in speed of KJ Hamler. KJ Hamler is pure speed. So this is what potentially we are looking to see. And he's on a cheap deal. I'll take that and save my $5 million and say bye-bye, Mr. Hardy, and hello, Mr. Hamler. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the speed that he brings to Buffalo. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, quick, in, quick in and out of breaks. 
get him on, get him returning some some kicks and punts. Uh, who knows what we'll do? Naeem Hines potentially is coming back, so we'll see on that part. Deontay Hardy, return man specialist, but not enough. He didn't even do enough in the return for us to even bring him back as a receiver. I'm out on that. So KJ Hamler, process. We're gonna see what he brings forward to the table. Obviously, we're gonna hit the the, the draft picks, and are we gonna be hitting receivers? So we're gonna see how this this receiver room all pans out. And then last but not least, we got uh, Tyrell Shavers, speed, size. He's a little um, a little slimmer, um, but six six, and he he had some splashes that we saw in uh, in preseason to see. Okay, what can this brother do? So I'm looking forward to see what he does. I I'm not my helps are not that high but shavers i i really want to see what he's able to do i was hoping out sometime this year when we were kind of dipping into the practice squad was at one point where we're going to see tyrell shavers and i wanted to see how he was going to look out but we never brought that brother up so um andy isabella was getting the calls and rightfully so andy isabella obviously can can obviously kick and punt return and the brothers got speed so we'll see how that all plays out maybe we bring back andy isabella to try out and see if he can make the squad. But right now, Tyrell Shavers uh, is, is uh, obviously we signed him to a futures contract uh, just last year. So he'll be back. And uh, obviously, KJ Hamlin, we signed him to a futures contract as well. The tight end room is pretty simple, folks. Dawson Knox, King K, Quentin Morris. Quentin Morris is, is a, a free agent. And we also have Zach Davidson. Uh, that's, that's down the depth. We'll see more this offseason. But the two that stand out, Right now are Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid. Obviously, Dalton Kincaid um, worked his tail off and took the starting spot from um, Dawson Knox, which we knew was going to happen eventually. It was just a matter of time and a matter of opportunity. Now, that being said, Dawson Knox is being paid a lot of money. Dawson Knox is being paid a lot of money. And for what Dawson Knox is being paid and for what Dawson Knox is making uh, in terms of what he does on the pro- as production, I got a problem, bro. Because he signed a four-year, $52 million contract. Even when he did sign that contract, I was like, ooh, that's steep. That's steep. But he's he's going to be part of this team going forward. This is before we even went for Dalton Kincaid. So it makes sense. There wasn't much out there that we needed. He's homegrown. We drafted him. Why not give him the contract? For four years at 52 mil with a $7 million signing bonus, $31 million guaranteed. That is a wild contract. That is wild. He's earning $13 million a year. <laughs> when I think about this, I'm not going to lie. When I think about that, to me, that's wild. That is wild. Because I'm saying to y'all, man, I'm I'm looking at I, I gotta go back to this because I'm looking at um Dawson Knox in the sports the spot track contract at 13, 13 mil a year is wild. Now here's the deal. The Bills have a potential out on moving on from Dawson Knox, right? Uh in 2025. So right now in going into the season 2024. He's earning some good money, man. 14, the four, the cap hit for Dawson Knox is at 14.3. So moving on from him, there's a dead cap hit of 20 mil. So folks, that's a lot of money tied into Dawson Knox at 14 mil. 14 mil he's made. That's the cap hit right now. As at 14 million dollars. If I'm Brandon Bean, I'm looking at this like, Oof, okay, we got to talk. Clearly, if we're being honest with each other, you're tight end number two. That doesn't compute. So either you take a pay cut, we restructure your deal, or we may have to make a decision. What do you want to do? Do you feel that you're worth it to stay on the squad? Do you want to be part of this process that we're moving forward and we're trying to get this dub here and we're trying to make something happen? We have something special here. You two can work together. But if you're not about that, let me know. So that's where Dawson Knox and his people are going to have to discuss this. Now, I think it's a no-brainer. If they come to him and say, hey, we need you to take a little cut, he should be like, where do I sign? 
But if he's like, nah, man, you got you guys got to honor the contract. You guys paid me. I'm going to stick to it. He doesn't give me that impression that he's that type of person because I've spoken to him personally myself. This guy is a gem. Dawson Knox is as nice as they come, super chill. And I enjoyed myself and Z-Bob. We enjoyed talking to him. Super chill guy. So if they approach him, I think he understands the gravity, the nature and gravity of what is going forward. We ain't got no money, bro. Luckily, the NFL made a lot of money. So our cap dwindled just a little, actually by 20, 20 to $30 million. We're 50 mil. We're now down to in the 30s, right? So that being said, I come to you again, Mr. Knox. We need you to restructure and take a bit of a cut because you're not going to get the touches that Dalton Kincaid is going to get. And that doesn't compute, so you got to take a cut. I, I believe wholeheartedly that Dawson Knox will accept. He has to if he wants to stay on the squad. Because if he doesn't, which I really, really doubt he will, I can see them saying, all right, we're going to move on for Dawson Knox. He's going to be a free agent because we ain't got no choice. So look for him to be part of the process because he's going to have to make some changes contractually to make this thing work. This, this is huge. Brandon Bean was, was, um, was, was heard talking about he expected the cap to increase about 240. Right now, it's at 250, 255, and he had a big smile on his face. So that tells me there's going to be some money moved around, and maybe, just maybe, we can make a couple somewhat splashes in free agency. I'm not talking about huge, but it, you know, maybe a little drop, a little drop. Uh, so hopefully that's what takes place. But as for the, the receiver room and the dot in the tight end room, Dalton Kincaid process. I don't got to talk about it. He used 70, 73 receptions over 600 yards. He was solid. He was solid this year. And I loved everything about, about him. So smooth out of his breaks can catch the ball with no problem. The guy is just a star I and mean, he's a star in the making, but for Dawson Knox, as for Dawson Knox, uh, love the brother, but he is going to have to take that cut. <laughs> He's going to have to take that cut in order for him to remain on the squad. And that's no disrespect. It's just, it's just what it is. It's just what it is at the end of the day. So that being said, when it comes down to the tight end room, um, Dawson Knox, solid player. But if you look at his production from this year, let's talk about it. Dawson Knox this year had 13 games played. Obviously, he got banged up a couple times. Uh, during the season, and that's where Dawson Knox, I mean, Dalton Kincaid came in and really took advantage and took over. 22 receptions off of 36 targets, 186 yards, two touchdowns this year, and um, we, we go from there. I'm not even going to talk about the drop passes because we know that happens in the game. But Dawson Knox, at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, there are some moments of inconsistency where he's dropping off football. He's not as fluent. He's not as as potent, and he's not as uh, trustworthy as a Dalton Kincaid. So if he doesn't take that cut, or if the Bills are like, hey, we're going to move you, man. We're going to move you. We want you to keep your money, and we have someone that's willing to take on your contract. You're out of here. I could see that happening as well. But I think homegrown, they're going to want to keep him. They, they like this, this two tight end combination. And uh, hopefully that's that's what happens, and he takes the pay cut. But <clears throat> I don't think it's happening. So that's what I see from my, my man Dawson Knox. Now Don Kincaid. Now that is a that's a stud. That is a stud. Six hundred seventy three yards receiving this year. Seventy three receptions. Nine point two yards a pop. Two touchdowns. That's going to increase very much so next year. He had. Uh, Five big plays this year, and uh, obviously he had that one fumble, and he had 311 yards of yak. I love 311 yards of yak. Folks, he was third place on the team when it comes to yak. 400 yards, almost 400 yards of yak yards for Stefan Diggs. After that, that was James Cook. After that, that's Dalton Kincaid. That boy's a yak monster, boy. So Dalton Kincaid is going to be special. He's going to be processed all day. So Dalton process. Knox, that's the big one. And that's what I want to know how you guys feel. Do you like Dawson Knox to remain on the squad? Is he part of the process or is he part of the problem? Are we going to move on from Dawson Knox? Are we not even going to bother 
telling him to take a pay cut because it's wild for me to think that they're going to allow this brother to make $14 million this year and stay put on the squad, giving you 22 receptions for less than 200 yards. That does not compute. <laughs> that doesn't compute. So two things are going to happen. He's taking a pay cut. He remains with the team or they flat out just trade his ass or cut him. So do I want him on the squad? Yes. I like Dawson Knox. I think he's great for the team. Uh, I think he's great for the tight end room and he's selfless. That's one thing I really do like. He's selfless. He knows his role. He absolutely knows his role. So I'll, I'll take that. So I'll make Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox part of the process and we'll go from there. Now, Quentin Morris most likely will not be back. I think he's going to be uh, looking for work elsewhere. Uh, I like Quentin Morris. I thought you saw that. If we can bring Quentin Morris back and have the same trio back again, sign me up. But uh, I think we I think we go with uh, those two big-time tight ends, and then we probably bring uh, somebody else in and, and take over as a third tight end that just is inactive or just a, just a roster spot. But I don't know if they just want to give the roster spot to just anybody. Does Quentin Morris come back? I hope he does, but I don't think he does. I think he walks, and I think he's going to look for an opportunity elsewhere to start because right now he has no chance of starting on the squad. It's not happening. Contributing, maybe, but if Dawson Knox is still there, slim chances. If Dawson Knox, they move on from him, then Quentin Morris can come in and be the tight end number two, and I really like him. So that is where we stand. So all together, looking at the receiver room and looking at the tight end room, I think it's it's clear what we need to do. Stefan Diggs, obviously, process. Gabe Davis, problem. I think he's going to be looking for uh, an opportunity elsewhere. I think he'll probably get it. What kind of money he gets, I have no idea. That's going to be the interesting one. But you know how free agency is, is crazy. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, Khalil Shakir, process. Dawson Knox, process. If he does the necessary things he needs to do. Trent Sherfield, problem. Deontay Hardy, problem. KJ Hamler, process. We're going to see how that plays out in terms of speed and how it does things. And uh, Tyrell Shavers, I'm interested to see what he does. Process for now until we bring in some draft picks. Because you know big-time draft picks are coming. Now, if you're looking at free agency and what type of free agent receivers that, that are out there that can really, um, really make a difference for this Bills team, let's talk about it. Let's go to... Uh, to see these free agent receivers that are out there and uh, and what what uh, what can be brought forward and uh, how things can work out. So free agent receivers that are out there right now that with this new, I guess, cap that we uh, that we've acquired or that every team has acquired. Let's see what we got here and who's available. So looking at the list of available receivers. Mike Evans, we ain't sniffing that. Odell Beckham Jr. probably won't come to Buffalo. He'll probably go back to, to Baltimore. Who knows how that plays out? Curtis Samuel. I like him. He has some stints uh, in Carolina, I believe, and then went to uh, to Miami, uh, excuse me, to Washington. Tyler Board is going to be available. for. He's a slot receiver. I think we're good at the slot receiver. If we're looking for anything, it'd be on the outside. DJ Chark. Paris Campbell is a slot receiver. Um... I like Braxton Berrios, but I think Khalil Shakir has, has, has checked the box for receivers coming in. Now, if we can get a Calvin Ridley, obviously he's, gonna, he's going to determine a big bag. I can't see Jacksonville let him just walk and go somewhere else. I think they're going to try to, I think they're gonna try to bring him back. But Calvin Ridley uh, is an unrestricted free agent. So he'll, he's going to require quite, quite a bag. And right now, if I look at his market value, $17 million a year. I don't know if the Bills are ready to pay that type of money for that. And I think this draft is going to solve a lot of our problems. Noah Brown is going to be available as well. Um, six years into the into the league right now. Uh, was, a, was a former seventh-round draft pick. His market value is at 5.6. So Noah Brown could be a name that we want to pay attention to, but I think that we're going to be focusing purposely. I think we're focused on strictly the draft. I can't see us making splashes in free agency, but I've seen more interesting things happen. I didn't think we were going to get Von Miller on the squad. We went ahead and gave this boy six mil. I mean, six years, 120 mil. So stranger things have definitely happened. But as of right now, 
uh, cap space uh, is helping us because they've they've given us some more room. But for the most part, we still broke. <laughs> we still broke. We're going to have to move some things around. Josh Allen's contract uh, restructure is going to help. That frees up about 22 mil. We've talked about that before. So that will give us some a lot of room. And then once we start moving some pieces around, we'll get into the green, but by how much? And what can we do with what we do uh, when we do get that money? So we'll see. We will see. So that's it for me, folks. Um, one last thing that I wanted to touch on before I get out of here. Uh, if you guys watched my man Z-Bot show last night, um, obviously a great show as always. That's my guy. And uh, But one thing that, that stands out, and I loved what I saw from Z-Bot. If you guys watched it, if you haven't, go ahead and peep it. He did it in, the, in the early stages of the show. He gave a, uh, he asked for his, his dad to be his best man in his wedding. Buddy, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not an emotional man. I don't know. There's some people that are in here that but there's certain things that certain things happen and it could get you emotional. For me, it's when grown men are teary eyed. <laughs> when I see a grown man teary eyed, I'm like, <laughs> gets you, gets you in the feels. Right. And uh, my man Zbot asked his father to be his best man in his wedding. How dope is that? Now he didn't just say, Hey dad, I want you to be my best man in my wedding. No, 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 no. They've had a special relationship going um obviously for, for obviously for years obviously and uh but their their moment with each other is watching football and watching the bills and that's how they connect and uh they've connected that way for years and they've celebrated and had a good time and you can see the genuine relationship that him and his father have what a tribute i absolutely listen i sent i sent him a text and i was like buddy you nailed it you absolutely nailed it that's the way it's supposed to be done I'm a very, very, very much a family man. I got I got four kids of my own. I got a 21-year-old that just turned 21 just the other day. I got my little guy, and I got my two daughters. And family is everything to me. And when I see that, that family dynamic, when you got your son is asking for the – amazing, amazing. And this is what I love about the crew that we have at BF because, I mean, you guys have seen myself and my brother were quite tight. And uh, I bring them on the show, and we banter. It's all about that. So when you see things like that, Kudos to my guy, Bot. He knows he crushed it. Great tribute, like my man Scott, Scott Blakely said it. And you see it, man. When you have, when you have people that you, you've followed for years and you, you start to get to know them. I mean, you guys have seen me. I bring my kids on. I bring the wife on. So you, you kind of have an idea of who I am slightly, right? Instead of before you've actually met me. So you have an idea what z like. He's brought his, his, his fiance on. Now you've seen his father. It's just, a, it's cool to see. And uh, even Laura's ready to choke up right now. Hey, Laura, you ready to choke up? Um, but yeah, it was a really amazing moment. Uh, great, great job by Bot. I think it was amazing that he did that. And uh, it's going to be an amazing wedding. It's going to be an amazing wedding, I'm sure. So I had to give a big shout out to my guy, Z-Bot. Great, great job, big guy. That was awesome, for sure. So that being said, folks, uh, that is my time. Uh, I appreciate you guys always tuning in. And uh, next video will be next uh, next week. If I don't do one this Friday, It'll be next week, and we're going to touch on the trenches, O-line, D-line. So we're going to hit the O-line, the D-line, and then hopefully we'll get to the linebackers and the safeties, and then we'll get the special teams, and that will be the series. So much love to everybody. I appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, you guys always show love, and the love is reciprocated. I want to show love back to you guys, and uh, we will catch you guys in the next video. So until next time, my Bills people. Buffalo Fanatics. We will catch you guys on the flip. I'm going to start doing some videos on free agent uh, players that could we could acquire. And uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys think. And obviously, we're going to start hitting the draft very soon. So until next time, it's your boy Rico. It's the Buffalo Fanatics. And we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Until next time, peace. It's your boy. And we are out. Have yourself a great night. Peace. Mm-hmm.